Welcome for the eighth time to members and guests to this, our quarantine special. It's November and November obviously means that it's remembrance time uh, and, the, uh, and the time when we commemorate the armistice in 1918 when the guns finally fell silent uh, or not as we shall see shortly. Um, this time, remembrance period has been rather unusual. It's been a time where uh, certainly here in Ipswich for the very first time in 50 years the uh, Suffolk Regiment Old Comrade Standard wasn't able to be on parade at the main service at Christchurch Park in Ipswich, although fortunately we were still able to lay a wreath in a, in a much uh, reduced service and, uh, and I was very pleased to see that services were carrying on all over the country and that, uh, and that message of remembrance and, uh, and the commemoration still carried on. So what I thought I'd do this month was to look back at the time uh, leading up to uh, the armistice and, and, and after and, um, and, and maybe just have a look at a, a period of the war that a lot of people don't know a great deal about. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that in many people's minds that the First World War can be summed up almost entirely uh, in, in trenches, in shell holes, in barbed wire, um, in static warfare with very, very little changes. Um, our image uh, very often driven by uh, those hel helpful comedy series like Blackadder uh, with, with, with quotes like um, making a gargantuan effort to move General Haig's drinks cabinet six inches nearer to Berlin. Um, but actually the reality, of course, is very, very different. And 1918 is really the year when everything changes. After the big German offensives in March and April, um, by July the boot was suddenly on the other foot and in, in a, a, a huge counter-attack in July uh, the British Army starts moving the other way. And then from the 8th of August uh, pretty much the whole army keeps rolling. And I think it's, uh, I, I think it's one of those things that so few people realise just how far the army moved. They, they moved so far in those last few months of the war that they literally outstrip their supply lines. It gets to the stage where uh, it's almost the case that uh, that the army had, 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 had outrun their supply lines so far that the war literally couldn't have been continued much longer uh, just because the troops at the front were advancing so far and so fast that it wasn't possible to keep them supplied with ammunition and food and to keep that attack going. And also the kind of territory that they're fighting in by the time that uh, we, we reach the, uh, the the sort of the last big obstacle is is the Hindenburg line, um, which the Germans uh, at the beginning of 1917 the the Germans had, had already prepared this massive defensive fortification. They'd used canals and uh, uh, as, as natural barriers and fortified them. Huge belts of barbed wire. Uh, they were using tunnels, uh, sort of canal tunnels as, as billets, completely impervious to shell fire, and after the, all of the fighting on the Somme at the beginning of 1917, they then retreated back to the Hindenburg Line as this sort of, uh, like I say, intentionally impregnable barrier that was going to be incredibly difficult to cross. Um, but by the time that the British and, uh, and their allies break the Hindenburg Line, uh, the Germans can already see that the writing's on the wall. Because to be honest, by the time you get past the Hindenburg Line, there was very, very little in the way of defences, pretty much until you reach Germany. This is a copy of the map that was on the wall of Sir Douglas Haig's headquarters. 
And it shows the dispositions of the Allies and the, and the German armies on the 25th of September 1918. It's the day that the British and the Allies broke the Hindenburg Line. And as you can see, right up here in the north, uh, the Germans opposite the Belgian army, clearly not too worried about the Belgians. Right down to the south, again, because of the terrain, there, there was no chance at all that there was going to be a massive offensive launch down there. So again, the German army, very, very few troops opposite the, uh, the, uh, opposite the French all the way down there. You can see here the, the American army, uh, again, with very few German troops opposing them. Again, one of the reasons for that is that the Americans are fighting their way through the Argonne Forest. Uh, and, uh, and so the Germans don't need a huge number of troops to, uh, to, to, to deal with that. As we travel further north up the Western Front, we can see how the resistance is stiffening, uh, particularly in the French troops, which are adjacent to the British Army. Uh, you can see here the Germans getting more and more divisions crammed in opposite the, uh, the French here. And then here, opposite the British and Commonwealth forces, the Germans are cramming as many divisions as they possibly can. Admittedly, by this time in the war, the, uh, these divisions, these German divisions, are completely under strength. There's no doubt about that at all. But the Germans, in late September 1918, are in absolutely no doubt at all where the blow is going to come. They are in no doubt whatsoever who it is who's about to beat them. And you don't need me to tell you that. You can look at this map and you can see exactly what the German commanders themselves were thinking in late 1918. And... Once the British Army had broken through the Hindenburg Line, once they were out into the country beyond, trenches literally become a thing of the past. It's fighting in the open, it's fighting through villages, and those villages have got hardly any damage. Um, it, it's, uh, it's fighting through woodland, it's crossing streams and rivers. Uh, it, it's completely virgin territory. And it's such a breakaway from anything that we're familiar with. It really is. And, um, and so... As some of those units gradually uh, come to a halt, some units gradually uh, re reach their sort of final destination, if you like, uh, units like the 11th Battalion Suffolk Regiment, who, who I've mentioned in other talks. Uh, the 11th, who's, um, who'd had that terrible beating on the first day on the Somme in 1916, and a, another one at Rue Chemical Works in uh, April 1917, and, uh, and a, a really rough time during the German March Offensive, and then when they were moved up to the Ypres Salient for rest, uh, and, and the second German offensive crashed on top of them and nearly smashed them to pieces. Um, they are actually the last Suffolk Regiment unit in combat. After all that, the 11th Suffolks finished their war in a little village called Burmerain, a place that nobody's ever heard of, uh, where they, uh, they push just beyond the village and fire their final shots from a drainage ditch at the side of a field that, uh, that nobody will ever visit. And, uh, and for an awful lot of units, that's exactly what happened in a way that their war didn't really so much as end as fizzle out. Having said that, there were other units which were still fighting hard. The, uh, by by the, the, the last couple of months of the war, in, uh, at the end of September, October, uh, and into November of 1918, um, it was all about firepower. Uh, every infantry battalion were having more and more Lewis guns issued to them, uh, just about as much firepower as they could possibly put down. Um, the, uh, the supply lines uh, were completely extended uh, to the point where the, the, the war literally couldn't have continued much longer because it wouldn't, literally wouldn't have been possible to keep that, those supply lines running. Um, it was a, a remarkable achievement and all sorts of work had been going on behind the scenes in terms of road networks, in terms of railways, working out how to make the best use of, uh, of all of the transport links to keep those supplies coming, to, to keep the wounded um, flowing back and to keep more supplies of soldiers, of, of equipment, of food, of weapons, of ammunition, keep heading towards the front line. It really was a, a, an incredible logistical achievement. The end when it came uh, didn't end in one, in one go. Uh, the central powers had been gradually collapsing in a heap uh, for, for, for quite some time. In September, uh, 29th of September, on the Salonika front, the Bulgarians had asked for an armistice, and, uh, and on the 29th that came into effect. Um, on the 30th of October, uh, the Turks... Um, in, in Palestine, uh, they, they knew that the game was up there. They asked for an armistice. Um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the 3rd of November. And finally, the German army um, finally knew that, uh, that, that it was all over. And the German politicians 
uh, went and met with the with, with the with the Allies to organise the terms of an armistice. Um, they met on the eighth of November, and uh, realising that the game was up, the the Kaiser abdicated on the ninth. Uh, I don't believe he asked for a recount, um, and then on the eleventh that armistice came into effect. There was some disappointment. Um, Certainly, uh, the American army were fighting hard right up until the last moment. Um, there was a, a, a lot of soldiers who believed that, that the fighting should have carried on, that the Germans uh, shouldn't have been allowed an armistice, uh, that very much that, uh, that the armistice was, was letting them off and that they really needed to, to be absolutely, completely and utterly defeated. Um, the French were expecting a, a massive offensive in 1919. In fact, a lot of the planning had been for a big offensive in 1919. Uh, the French very keen to to launch an offensive to recover uh, the the uh, re recover the area of Lorraine, uh, which the Germans had taken in the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s. Um, and they didn't want it by negotiation. They wanted to take it by feet of arms. Um, so there was a, a a lot of um, a lot of disappointment from from some from some countries and from a lot of soldiers that that didn't happen. Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, the commander of the British armies in France, and a man nearly always misrepresented as an officer who couldn't give a stuff how many of his own men had to get killed in order to achieve victory, realised that the Germans were serious about the armistice. And he asked, why expend more British lives? And for what? And so a few days later, on the 11th of November, the armistice came into being and the guns finally fell silent on the Western Front. All over the world, people were celebrating the end of the Great War. Or not, because there was still fighting going on around the world. In Russia, the revolution had led to a civil war, and the Allies had taken the part of the White Russians against the Red Bolsheviks. And there would be British troops and sailors still getting killed right up until the end of October 1919, during the North Russia intervention, as it was called. In East Africa, uh, Paul von Leto Forbeck, the, uh, the German commander of the, the Askaris, the, the German Askaris in what was then Tanganyika, had led an incredibly successful campaign throughout the entire war. In 1914, um, the, the Germans had, uh, had no means whatsoever to, to resupply their, uh, their empire, their, their empire in East Africa. And the only sensible thing to do, really, would have been for the German garrison there to surrender. But Leto Forbeck decided to, to lead his Askaris in a, a campaign of defiance which would see the, the British, South Africans, Indian, French troops tied up, literally, for the entire war, uh, crisscrossing every single part of Tanganyika and across into other countries. And when the war finally came to an end on November the 11th, 1918, Leto Forbeck and his troops didn't even know. And it was several days later before they finally bumped into uh, British troops who said, you know, you do know it's all over. And, um, and it wasn't until the, the 25th of November that the Germans in East Africa finally agreed terms. And even then, having led a campaign which, uh, in which they were literally undefeated, uh, the German officers were allowed to keep their swords as a sign of respect. So there was still plenty of stuff going on. Uh, there were um, all, all sorts of other campaigns. The, uh, the, the Turks, having been beaten during the war, um, were, were then occupied by various Allied forces. Um, and the Turks had decided they weren't going to have that. So straight away, uh, they launch a, a war of Turkish independence and, um, and, and one after the other beat all of those countries that were, uh, that, that were essentially occupying them, including the British who, who'd been occupying Constantinople as, a, as an army of occupation uh, and were driven out. And, uh, and by uh, the, the end of 1919, the, the Turks were then uh, fighting the Greeks, but, uh, but had dealt with the occupying forces. And despite the fact that their Ottoman Empire had, had gone, uh, they still managed to regain their respect uh, pretty soon after the war. And uh, uh, Kemal Ataturk, the, uh, the, the, who'd been a famous Turkish commander who, who'd done great work at Gallipoli, became the, the leader of the nation and, uh, and, and led the Turks on a, on, on a, a much more enlightened path for, for, for many years after the war. Um, back at home, the situation was uh, was pretty grim. Obviously, as we know now, um, in the situation we're in as well, a lot of people were very worried about government debt. It was going to be a burden that uh, that would hang around the necks of uh, uh, of everybody in the country for many many years to come. Conscription had come to an end on the 11th of November 1918, pretty much the moment that the armistice was declared, and that was a massive problem because. 
there were huge commitments for the British Army all over the world. There were garrison duties and tidying up and all sorts of stuff that needed to carry on. And there was a, a massive need of manpower to, to, to carry out those roles. And the men who'd fought the war wanted to go home. So then there needed to be uh, more men, more recruits coming through to, to replace those men who wanted to go home. Um, that led to massive problems um, in places like the, the huge base depot at Kantara on the Suez Canal. Thousands and thousands of men all stuck in a camp in the middle of nowhere on the edge of the Egyptian desert. Um, just absolutely sick and tired of the First World War and wanted to go home. Um, even at home, even the troops who, uh, who, were, who hadn't yet been discharged. There were mutinies in places like Kinmore Park in Wales and, uh, and in Dover. So uh, there was a great deal of unrest uh, by, by soldiers who, who'd had enough. Um, and the process, that, that whole demobilisation process, um, Eddie Hazelwood, who'd served with the 8th Service Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment, he'd uh, been awarded the, the DCM and the MM for bravery as a stretcher bearer. And um, by, the, by the end of the war, he's a, a sergeant in, in the 7th Service Battalion, and, uh, which, which had become a training unit by the end of the war. And he volunteers to stay behind. And the, uh, the brigadier, who by then is the divisional commander, uh, because as the division shrunk, it didn't need a major general to run it anymore. Um, he, he writes to, uh, to, to that, that handful of troops who volunteered to stay behind and thanks them and says, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing because uh, you're, you're very well aware that all the time you're here, there are other men now going home who will take all the jobs. Uh, and that, of course, was, a, was another real problem in its own right that when men got home, the, the, uh, there was, uh, the, the, the jobs just weren't there. There was a, a massive amount of people all suddenly arrive in, in, one, in one go. And, and, and even those who'd had their jobs um, held for them until the end of the war get back to discover that the world has moved on and that the people that they'd worked with uh, in 1914 had now been promoted and that they were at the bottom of the heap, which if they, uh, if they ended up by the end of the war being promoted, if they'd been a sergeant or a company sergeant major or an officer suddenly to find yourself uh, not only not being looked up to uh, and, and, and being in a position of responsibility of controlling a lot of men, suddenly you were right down at the bottom of the heap again and, uh, and you were a nobody. And it was a real struggle for a lot of them to, to, to readjust to that domestic life. Um, wife beating goes up enormously in, in the years after the war as, as men who'd been trained for four years uh, for violence and to do violence to other people struggle to find their place back in the world again. And against this, uh, the backdrop of, um, of massive, massive government debt, which is going to be hanging around everybody for years and years and years. Um, I guess we're all familiar with that. And in addition, the Spanish flu pandemic, which forms the backdrop to everything that's happening around the end of the war. Uh, that the, uh, the pandemic, which in the space of really a matter of months, had killed 50 million people far more people, almost twice as many people in a matter of months uh, as the war had killed in four years. And so everything that's going on here needs to be seen against that backdrop. In other places, there, there were minor wars and, uh, and campaigns going on in places like Waziristan, uh, the, uh, the third Afghan war uh, was happening on the northwest frontier, um, so in India, in Montenegro, in, in Romania, in Hungary. Um, uh, I mean, it, all, all over the place, in, in, in Eastern Europe, the, the Poles, the, the Lithuanians, uh, there was massive unrest, there was readjustments, there were little civil wars going on, everybody trying to gain advantage at the end of the war and trying to get the, the, best, possible, um, the best possible result from the peace negotiations, because all of these little wars and all of these little, um, these little campaigns were having a direct effect on the negotiations that were happening at the Versailles Peace Conference. Um, the German Navy, um, who in 1918 had had, to, uh, had had to sail the entire high seas fleet to, to scarp a flow up in Orkney, um, in, a, in a final massive act of defiance, uh, more or less the entire German high seas fleet had been scuttled in, in, uh, towards the end of June on the day that the uh, Versailles Peace Conference was due to be signed. And, um, and, and nearly all of the, the German Navy were sent to the bottom of, uh, of Scarpa Flow. A year after the armistice, there were still 20 or 30 wars, civil wars and campaigns rumbling on all around the world. It turned out that it had been much easier to start the Great War than it was to stop it. Thank you all very much.
Uh, next month, December's talk. Still not thought what we're going to do for that yet, although we've uh, had plenty of people writing in with ideas. And um, so all that remains is to say thank you all very much indeed. And um, please do remember to subscribe, if you haven't already, to the Great War Huts YouTube channel. Thank you all very much.